Hello and welcome to the 30th Sports Media Tea Time Talks. It's our first session in 2022. We are part of the Interpol Young Academy. My name is Mohammed from University of Oslo and I'm your host today. Also accompanying me in the studio, Marcel Moura from University of Oslo, Korla, and also Nora Brando from Federal University of Oberlandia. Chorus Media Tea Time Talks are a platform for young and early career researchers to present their work to the broad scientific community worldwide. The Chorus Media TTT uh, aims to act as a complementary platform to already very successful geoscience and geoenergy webinars, which is organized by Hadi and Sebastian. Before starting, I would like to thank Tom Boltrace and Maya Rooker, two co-founders and co-organizers, and also Ariane Massini, a co-organizer co of PMTTT, uh, that um, they are no longer with us, and we deeply appreciate all their time, energy, and inputs for the success of Post Media TTT initiative. Now, let's introduce our first speaker today. Um, Haiyang Zhang completed his master's in petroleum engineering department at Khalifa University, and now conducts his doctoral research in their PhD, in their PhD program in Abu Dhabi. Hayan joined the um, MSc program in, two, in June uh, 2019 after finishing his BSc in Petroleum Engineering from China University of Petroleum in East China. His research interest is related to digital rock physics. Today, he will give a talk on upscaling of permeability from tomographic images of carbonates. Hayan, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, for introduction. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Haya, and I'm a PhD student in Halifa University. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to give a presentation. The title is Carbon and Rock Permeability Upscaling from 3D Tomographic Images, a Modified Remolation Method. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, here's here's a short introduction to permeability upscaling. There are several upscaling methods, and here I will briefly introduce new micro simulation and the renormalization methods. Suppose that we have already know uh, the permeability of each fine cell Kij. Uh, for the numerical simulation, we calculate the pressure and uh, flow rate of each fine cell, and then we can have the total flow rate. Therefore, the upscale permeability or effective permeability can be determined by dust's flow equation. But the renormalization methods gives an analytical expression to calculate the effective permeability. For example, the effective permeability of these four blocks can be calculated by Keynes solution expressed in this, uh, in this, in this equation. And we will use the 3D renormalization methods in our study. Here's the examples. Uh, here's the example. We select the silicon dolomite or being for carbonate and to tar carbonate. As, as this figure shows, uh, the resolution is selected 13.24 micrometers for SD, 0.81 for A4, and 0.94 uh, for TC. And the below figures are the micro CD images for the three samples. We conduct laboratory measurements on these three samples such as mercury injection capillary pressure test. And we have the MICP porosity, or we can see the connective porosity. And we have the total porosity and the plug permeability. These are the post through size distribution curves for, the, for these three samples. From the left, uh, left figure, the pole through size SD, uh, uh, yes, uh, the pole through size SD, it's mainly between one micrometer and 35 micrometer. And uh, the pole through size with the radius 10 micrometer are dominated. For a for sample, smaller pole, uh, smaller pole through size and wider pole through size distribution, which may lines between 0 0.01 micrometer to five micrometer are found. While TC sample has the widest pole size distribution, ranging from one nanometer to 40 micrometers and more peaks can be clearly observed from the distribution curve. So we extract uh, some samples from the original three sets of the images and below table shows the properties including 
the image size, the resolution, the power state. Then we use the uh, uh, interactive thrash recording method to segment the images. The first three images are the segmented images, where the black represents the pulse space and the white are the solid faces. And the last three uh, uh, three images are the 3D visualization of the selected domains, where the blue color represents the uh, uh, connected pulse space and the green color represents the unconnected poles. This is an introduction to one of the renomad methods, uh, which is proposed by Carl and the company Hoft, we term it uh, KRM. To calculate the permeage of the whole block, they divide it into eight parts, and each part has a non-zero permeability. There's two combination ways for, config uh, for configuration A, the permeability is calculated by the first equation, which is the lower bound of permeability. And for configuration B, they use this equation to calculate the upper bound of permeability. And it is believed that the equivalent permeability lies between the upper and the lower bound. So they take the square root of the product of these two bonds. Based on the QRM, we split the samples into eight, eight parts and the Paul network model was extracted from each part to calculate the permeability. And the permeability of the whole sample was also calculated. The first table shows these values. And we use those equations to calculate the lower bound, upper bound, and the equivalent permeability. Of course, we have the direct permeability, which, uh, uh, which are the ground truth, and we, ca and we calculate the relative errors. So you can find that the relative errors are high, uh, which are around uh, 40%. Uh, uh, the high, the relative high relative errors are caused by due to the fact that the direct permeability does not line between the lower bound and upper bound. And if, and, uh, uh, and the same problem can be found if we use the, if we use the, uh, data in the study below. So we are thinking, can we find the description of the equivalent permeability and the true permeability? This means that we need enough data pairs to gather the relationship between these two values. And we propose a regression-based normalization methods and we term it RKIM. Here's the workflow. Uh, we firstly calculate the equivalent permeability using the KRM. And we select a subsample and calculate is the equivalent permeability and the direct and the direct permeability like the uh, red, red cube. And then we slide to a new position and I select the second subsample, sub, sub like the green cube. And we calculate the same data. So the whole sample will be scanned and covered in three directions and the several, and the several data points will be uh, obtained, like uh, K1, uh, KU1 to K, uh, KUN. So we, we use this we use these uh, ended pairs to generate the linear relationship between the KE and the KD. And we have the K equivalent, the equivalent permit of the whole sample. And then we use this linear relationship to calculate the direct permeability. And we compare the results with the, with the ones that obtained by the laboratory measurement or the numerical simulation. For example, if the, si if the rock sample size <coughs> is 500, and the subsample size is 40, uh, 4, 4, 0, 100, uh, sorry, 440, and the step size is 20. So we can have 64 values of the KE and the KD. Here's the result for the three samples. The X axis is the equivalent permeability, and the Y axis is the direct permeability. So you can find there is a kind of linear relationship between the, these two values. So now we have the KRM equivalent permeability, which is calculated by those equations. And now we use this new equation, uh, the regression equation, to calculate the uh, RK, RKRM regression permeability. And we have the direct permeability. So we compare the relative errors. So you can find there is improvement on the currency. And then this upscaling approach uh, uh, method was applied for the fourth size sample. Because of the four, four, four sums, because of the four size sample, it is uh, cylindri uh, cylindrical. This uh, this kind of shape is cannot be used for calculation. So we select a cube body as big as possible from the original samples. This uh, table shows the original size and the selected size. 
so we we uh, uh, we we, we all, yeah similarly we slide the samples but in, uh, in one in the direction and to uh, get this uh, regression curves uh, x axis is the equivalent probability and y axis is the direct probability and we also calculate the each parts of the whole full size sample and the calculate the probability of each of each parts and this uh, table show the results so we use the original there is no much matter equation to calculate the equivalent probability and use the uh, regression equation obtained in last slide to calculate the regression probability and compared with the experimental probability. So you can find that uh, the relative to the relative errors are low. There is increase on the estimation currency. Finally, is the conclusions. The regression equation, which relates to the equivalent and the direct probabilities is obtained using the 64 subsamples for each stroke. The results indicate that the upscale probability using the regression equation are in good agreement with the ones obtained directly from the whole sample. And the proposed methods they employ to upscale the probability on four cells covered in rocks. The upscale probability corresponds to uh, approximately to the values measured in the laboratory with a maximum error of 11%. This suggests the occurrence of this method. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Haiyang, and uh, I welcome uh, the audience to type in the questions on the, on the field if you have any. Um, I have a quick one myself first. Um, yes. you, you have you have a very big spread on the on the permeabilities uh, according to the the, the sub samples, right? Like for instance, so on there or there's a couple of tables where that yes, you sure. had. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I mean, like for 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 a same uh, sample, but the, the Subsessions inside. Uh, go to the next one, please. Uh, next one. Next. Uh, next. Yeah. Uh, there, for instance, this uh, okay. subsample six uh, and uh, subsample one, for instance, of, on the third line of the TC. Yes. Yes. So this is uh, a very large spread. Uh, is this like by chance? You just uh, selected like one point that was uh, super tight in the sample. Could you just explain why was the reason for this very very large spread? Uh yes. Uh, actually, we 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 split into the, the parts and calculate the probability. They say the a probability for each part. That but because of the I think it is because of the drug heterogeneous heterogeneity that caused the high spread of the probability. And also mm -hmm. this high uh like uh probability contrast because the uh, that's that's why the original uh, Rinaldi method doesn't work for our samples because the Rinaldi method is sensitive to the permeability contrast, and that's mm -hmm. why, yeah. All right. Yes. Um, excuse me, just complementing Marcel's questions. It's something related to that. It's um, how can you ensure that you are working in a representative region of your sample as it, yes. so, yeah, as it has a big heterogeneity? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, for this part, uh, let me firstly show this one. For this size, we chose six hundred. It is not our represent. It is not our. It is not our IUV because we just mm -hmm. want validate the performance of the our method on this small size. Mm -hmm. And then because and then we use this method for the full size samples. Mm. And now. We, because we need to uh, select a subsample and a slide, a slide, slide. Okay. But, and actually we did the IUV analysis and we found that the IUV is, cannot be defined because of the drug heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. That's what, so we chose, a, uh, so we only slide our sample in Z direction. Mm -hmm. That okay. is the big, yeah, we chose the biggest uh, volume you know, mm -hmm. in Z direction. That's why we just have several, like five to eight data points in these figures. Yes, yes, I got it. Yes. And, and what type of rock are you working? It's carbon. Carbon, okay, Sorry? great, yeah. great, great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful, and I have two questions of my own. The first one yes. is about the resolution resolution of imaging. Is it? Yes. Uh, do you see any sensitivity when you, for example, consider submicron resolutions, or uh, or you coarsen up your voxel size? Do you see any difference? And the second one, 
since you are working with carbonates and in carbonates we, we often encounter uh, tight rocks. Do you think this the, the same method can be applied uh, for the tight carbonate rocks when you have heterogeneity or anisotropy? So it means that the properties change from one place to another place and also you have uh, different properties in in different directions. Thank you. Yes, yes, okay. So the first the question about the resolution. Uh, the resolution was selected, you say it's around uh, 13 micrometer. This is around uh, one micrometer. So if you look at this post size distribution, you can find that, uh, for, for example, for SD, the dominant post size is, um, is around, uh, is it, I can see it's a, a slightly bigger than 10, uh, 10 micrometers. So our resolution is fine because it can detect as much uh, the details and for a current calculation. And for E4 and TC, uh, actually you can find that there is a lot of pores uh, that cannot be detected under that resolution, but actually that resolution is the highest resolution that we can have. I mean, do not mention the uh, nanoscale, something like that. Uh, so uh, this method is about for the tight, uh, tight, tight jobs, uh, I think, I think it could work because this is a sliding process and it can, I mean, uh, it can, uh, you scan the sample and capture the details as much as possible because it's a sliding process and it is also uh, like, uh, I would say that's a curve fitting, a curve fitting to, fit, to find those features and to get uh, uh, the results. I mean, it could, it could work, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Super. Um, so I guess we don't have any other questions for now. So maybe it's time to move on for, to our next speaker. And this is uh, Ahmed Samir Hisk. He's a master's student at Khalifa University working on machine learning applications in petroleum engineering. He earned a bachelor's in petroleum engineering from Suez University in Egypt and Ahmed has also two years of experience working in the oil industry and is also an active member of the SPE Young Professionals. So, um, Ahmed, uh, do you do you hear us now? Uh, yes, Marcel. Okay, very good. Me? The floor is yours. We yeah. hear you well. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Ahmed Samir. And uh, first of all, thank you, Marcel, for this introduction. Today, I'm going to present my work about the machine learning perspective for estimating residual oil saturation from carbonate rock images. Uh, the structure the structure of the presentation starts with a background about the research, the motivation behind the research. Then I will go through the workflow of the machine learning, starting from digital images, feature engineering, data specimen simulation, machine learning. Then we will talk about the results and finally the conclusion. Uh, first of all, why residual oil saturation and why we need uh, machine learning to estimate it. First of all, the residual oil saturation can be, uh, can be uh, defined as a capillary trapped oil after conventional recovery techniques. And it's very important because it evaluates the effectiveness of different recovery stage. It's also important to screen the suitable EOR technique. That's, because, that's why uh, different methods have been developed to estimate this important parameter, including laboratory measurements and simulation techniques. However, laboratory measurements, which include core flooding and centrifuge, they suffer from different drawbacks. Uh, like exp They are expensive, they are time consuming, they are also limited to specific uh, range of operating conditions. For direct simulation techniques, they have been developed driven by the advancement in X-ray scanners, as well as the, the advancement in computation power of supercomputers. Uh, but these direct simulation methods uh, are very computationally expensive in terms of resources, as well as in terms of time. For example, if we want to simulate a cube rock sample of length 72, only 72 micrometers, this takes around 50 hours on two CPU cores. However, to reduce this number to three hours only, we need around 50 CPUs. And uh, repeating this process for several images is very, very resource consuming. 
That's why we introduced the machine learning workflow to estimate SOR. So the motivation behind this is that obtaining an accurate estimation of SOR is very essential to screen the best candidate or technique. And given that the current laboratory measurements uh, uh, and the direct simulation measurements are uh, suffer from different drawbacks, and we believe that machine learning can map the relation between the rock morphology and its initial condition to their respective SOR values. This is because the powerful nature of machine learning algorithms to include the relation between different parameters. We developed this workflow to estimate SOR in a very efficient and a quick way. First, we start with the grayscale image. We do some imaging processor, processing on it, like to segment it, to differentiate between the pores and the grid. Then we take uh, a large number of these images through two uh, processes. First one is feature extraction or feature engineering to extract some features that represents uh, the pore space and the morphology of the rock. As well as we do direct simulation on these samples to know what is the SOR values that we will get under a specific water flooding conditions. We take these values uh, from feature extraction as input labels and the SOR from direct simulation as output labels to the machine learning model. For uh, many, many samples, we develop, we train a machine learning model, we develop it, we test it, and then we use it to make the predictions. To start uh, through the workflow, we first should know what is the uh, digital image, which is a building block of this research. The digital image is made of picture image elements called the pixels or voxels in 3D. And this pixel or voxel contains a number of uh, uh, numbers that represent its color intensity. And we use a micro CT imaging technique. This technique uses X-rays to see inside the objects. It captures a series of 2D slices at different projection angles. Then they stack them together to uh, obtain the 3D image. The sample which we are working on here is a carbonate rock sample that was captured at a resolution of 0.48 micrometer, which is a very high resolution. Uh, and the size of this image is 500 by 500 by 920. Now to obtain large number of samples that is required to train the machine learning model. We use the same technique as Hang described, like we take a cube uh, and this cube goes through the, this image uh, and extract different heterogeneous of the sample. This cube has the size of 150 by 150 by 150. After this, we have a huge number of samples, like 7,449 7, samples. These samples then uh, are processed through segmentation to differentiate between the pore and the grade. After this, we do some feature engineering uh, on this sample. First, we calculate the porosity. The porosity can be calculated easily by dividing the number of pore uh, voxels by the total number of voxels. Also, we use a BNM uh, network model that is a simple technique to extract the pore size distribution and the throat size distribution of each sample. This pore net network model, uh, it simplifies the pore structure into uh, spheres that represent the pores and cylinders that connect these pores together. From this simplified uh, uh, model, we can have the, uh, an idea about the pore size distribution as well as the throat size distribution. Hey, here is an example of one of the samples of uh, how the pore size distribution, the throat size distribution can be represented uh, for a carbonate image. We also use a PNM uh, model to calculate the permeability of the image. Because of the simplified uh, architecture of this um, model, we can use or apply Hagen Poisson equation to calculate the flow rate. Then this flow rate is passed to the Darcy law to calculate the absolute permeability of the sample. Of course, this absolute permeability was, will not be the very accurate permeability of the sample, but it can give an indication about how the permeability of the sample looks like. And that's what we need to uh, explain or uh, explore the morphology of the rock and the different features that uh, can affect the prediction of a soil. We also use a novel technique developed, developed by Alrat Root et al. in 2017 to extract the surface roughness of the image. Where a mesh is generated to represent the rock surface, then a volume preserving curvature smoothing is applied. 
the curvature is measured for each point and from the curvature we use an equation to obtain the surface roughness. Here uh, is that Boltzmann simulation to calculate the SOR. And why we choose that Boltzmann? Because it has been uh, widely described in the literature that this method is accurate as it does not simplify the pore structure. And the original theory of it is the cellular automata theory, which represents the fluids as particles interact with each other in a billiard-like collision. Uh, and uh, we can define what is called the molecular density distribution function where, as the number of particles per unit volume per unit velocity of the rock, of the, of the fluid. Uh, and we we use a governing equation. It's 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 the lattice Boltzmann equation to simulate the evolution of, of the behavior of this density distribution function with time. And by relating this density distribution function to the macroscopic properties such as fluid density and the fluid momentum, we can obtain the macroscopic flow properties. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you can see the model of the equations, but I will describe as much as I can. Uh, we here, yeah, we here use a, a, a D3Q19 uh, model, which is a three-dimensional model and have velocity or density distribution function in 19 directions. We don't. We use also a color gradient model to represent the two phases. The scalar gradient represents each distribution function of uh, of uh, each fluid with distinct uh, color. The one is blue and one is red. Then the total density distribution function is the summation of the density distribution function of each fluid. But we don't use a simple BGK model for the single that is used in the single phase flow for simulating this behavior to phase flow, but we use a multi-relaxation time scheme that uses a, 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 a matrix that can map the density distribution function from the velocity space to the moment space. Here we can see how the experiments are done. First, we start with a small value of SW. Then, with injecting water into the sample, this uh, SW or the saturation photo increases in the sample until it reaches uh, a state or a steady state where with more injection of water, there is no change in the saturation of the water. At this point, we define our SOR and we take this as the value which we need. All of these parameters are uh, uh, passed through a machine learning model for training and this testing. The first parameter is, as we said, porosity, then we have the PN permeability, the pore size distribution, solid size distribution, we have the surface roughness, initial water saturation, we have the porosity profile and the initial water saturation profile as well, as well as the corresponding residual oil saturation for each sample. The, 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 the machine learning model is a tree-based model uh, which we have used. To understand what is a tree-based model, uh, we have to first understand what is a decision tree. A decision tree is an algorithm that uh, simplifies the data and do the regression or classification task by simplifying the data into the purest possible form. But only one decision tree is not enough to uh, make or to deal with huge problems. That's why we need a combination of decision trees. This combination of decision trees uh, are represented by algorithms like gradient posting and, and gradient expose. In this research, we concentrated on the gradient post method and we trained the model on the huge amount of data we have. Then we found that a, a very good correlation between the SOR predicted by Lattice Boltzmann and the SOR predicted by the model have been developed uh, with around 0.98 uh, uh, R square in the training set and 0.87 on the testing set. Of course, if we look here at the part which have uh, which represents the samples with high SOR, we'll find that many deviations, but this because the limited number of samples that have high SOR value. Hey, here we come to the conclusion. Based on this results, we know that the SOR 
uh, estimation is very accurate, is very important, and we need uh, accurate and fast way to estimate it because it it can be used in screening different EOR techniques, and because of the limitation of the current uh, uh, the current uh, simulation techniques like blood spots man, which require a very huge amount of time or huge amount of resources to simulate an image. We developed a machine learning model that based on 7,449 uh, data points were trained and tested. The graded post algorithm showed a high predictive capability with R square of 0.87. And this study finally it serves as a proof of concept and it can be extended to other rock samples as well as to different water flooding conditions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Thank uh, you. Do we have any questions? The studio? Um, I have a quick one. Um, how does the wettability enter the picture? Is it one of the one of the parameters that you feed into the model? Perhaps you have shown there already, but I just Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, now we are not interested in defining the, uh, the wettability of the rock. Uh, we have made this model or this uh, workflow as related to only specific case of uh, of water flooding conditions. So we have uh, fixed the different water flooding conditions like the wettability of the rock, the injection rate, the different parameters have been fixed. And we are trying to relate only what will happen if we change the morphology of the rock, what will have if we change the structure of the of the rock, like the pore geometry, all of these parameters which we are concerned about. Very nice. And do you think the method could be extended to other quantities as well? So you, you use the, the residual oil saturation as being like the, the, the thing that you want to predict. Do you think the other quantities could be uh, also predicted in this way? Yes, of course. Uh, I think uh, uh, like we have done this uh, for the residual oil saturation, which is uh, somehow it's a very, very complicated function of the different parameters. I think for other uh, uh, other parameters, other uh, quantities, it can be done. And many research in the literature have been uh, done for estimating the permeability, for example. Uh, also for estimating the pressures after uh, simulation, the velocity field, pressure field. Uh, all of these quantities have been done in the literature as well. Right. Okay. Um it's one wonderful results, Ahmad. Really interesting. I'm just wondering, uh, after how much training of the of the uh, the machine learning um, algorithm, it would be it would be trained enough to 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 be used for general purpose. For example, you trained it enough so everybody can use and you come and use your code to calculate residual saturations, brine and oil for their carbonates for their sandstone rocks. Do you think every every time we should uh, tune the algorithm or after enough training, it would be mature enough to present or provide good enough results? Yeah, it's a very good question and very interesting because uh, we have trained the model on a very uh, complex uh, uh, geometry like the carbonate rock. So if we want to extend for, uh, for other rocks like sandstone, this uh, kind of, uh, of heterogeneity does not exist as well. So I think it can be also extended to this, uh, to this kind of rocks like sandstone and all of this. Uh, however, uh, we have to consider uh, different parameters such as the size of the image, the, the resolution of the image. These are also parameters that need to be considered. Uh, but I can say that uh, like this workflow can be used as a proof of concept. Uh, what have been done on carbonate can be done on other uh, rocks as well. Exactly, exactly. And how far you are from calculating endpoint relative, uh, endpoint relative permeability values? Since you, you have the data for residual oil saturation, so it, should, it shouldn't be far for calculating endpoint relative permeabilities. Have you tried it? Any results? Uh, I can say, uh, like, it's an interesting point to research on, but still, uh, this is maybe included in future work as well. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Excellent. Congrats. Thank you very much. Then. Okay, so we move on to the closing of our sessions. We'd like to thank uh, both of our speakers from today. And uh, uh, the next session of the Tea Time Talk is already scheduled for the 1st of March. And uh, we are changing a little bit now, so we are going to have some sessions that will be a bit later than usual in uh, European time. Usually our sessions so far have been like at 10, half past 10 in the morning or, or 3 in the afternoon. But this one, it's at 6 o'clock in, uh, in Europe because we want to start to, to, to make the sessions a bit of a more reasonable time for the people in other time zones. So now in the Pacific time zone, it will be 9 o'clock. We have one speaker from there. So the two speakers will be uh, Tingyan Chekai from France and uh, Wei Liu Li from uh, Stanford University from the US. And that will be on the 1st of March, 2022. And uh, with that, I would like to finish the session. Thank you very much once again for joining. Uh, we look forward to see you next time. And uh, if you uh, would like to be a speaker, or if you'd like to nominate a speaker, we are always building a list of uh, potential future speakers. So feel free to contact us at uh, porousmediattt at uh, gmail.com. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>